We now return to Wednesday's proceedings examining the Waco investigation. Last week, a House Joint Subcommittee began hearings into events at Waco, Texas in the spring of 1993. These uh, joint committee hearings on Waco will come to order a little bit later than I hoped we would be coming back uh, from the break after the joint session of Congress. But nonetheless, we're here and gathered now. Uh, I don't believe there is a member on the minority side ready to ask questions at this juncture. I've been advised, and so I'm going to yield for his five minutes to Mr. Blute. Mr. Blute, you may proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the witnesses for their testimony today. I'd like to direct a question to Mr. Jamar, if I could. Uh, did you regularly get a memorandum from Mr. Smerick concerning uh, what was happening at Waco? Uh, the first week, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Smerick gave me memo, probably four memos. Did you find those memos helpful in the development of your strategy? Yes. In his March 7th memo to you, Mr. Smerick recommended that you bring in the local sheriff uh, to become more involved in the negotiations. Uh, did you act on those recommendations? Well, he was already involved before that. Was he, he involved he was, extensively, would you say? Yeah, he stayed with us all day, every day, from, from I think, the duration of the siege. Was his input uh, helpful uh, to Tremendously you? Tremendously helpful. We heard testimony earlier from an earlier panel, uh, from a Branch Davidian who had escaped, who had firsthand knowledge there, who seemed to indicate that uh, the relationship between the sheriff and Koresh was fairly cordial. Is that your understanding? Yes, the sheriff was uh, a type of man who um, had been sheriff for tw over 25 years. Um, very engaging man, extremely bright man. Uh, he knows how to communicate with people in that community. And he was extremely effective uh, with Korish. Was there any idea of using him uh, up front with Korish? We did. I think um, there's one instance where we put milk in where we made it look like it was the, the sheriff accomplished in order to build him up. Uh, I think you might want to ask Mr. Sage about the, there's a photograph up there, the face-to-face -face is a good example of the sheriff's commitment and his involvement with us. In, in Mr. Smerick's March 8th memorandum, he recommended that the resort to tactical pressure, quote, should be the absolute last option we should consider, mm -hmm. and that the FBI might uh, unintentionally make Koresh's vision uh, of, a, of a, a fiery end uh, come, come true. Uh, seemingly, you did not uh, uh, listen to that uh, uh, recommendation. Well, I don't think that, it, how do you want to define it and when? One of the points I tried to make earlier is, is establishing a perimeter and using armor to do that, is that tactical pressure? If it, we didn't do that, we wouldn't have stayed. We'd be gone. We'd have to leave. Remember, what we, when we arrived, there's four dead ATF agents, at least 16 wounded at least five people we knew about dead inside. You don't show up and try to establish control of something and put people in peril, although they were in, in very much peril the whole time. So that part, if you define tactical pressure as that, then no. As far as doing something to provoke them or anything like that, the first thing we did I think would be close to provocative was on the 15th of March, where we removed some debris from the we call the black side the back, from, as, if, as you recall from television, which you, the view you saw from the back, because it was some, some uh, building materials and stuff that they would go out and continue to fortify, and they kept leaving, so we wanted to remove that from them. Let me just ask Mr. Smerick if you would consider uh, operating Bradley fighting vehicles close to the compound uh, as a provocative uh, act. It wouldn't necessarily be construed as a provocative act. What it would do is uh, be perceived perhaps in a compound as additional stress being placed upon them. 
And so what I was concerned with, of course, is that if our goal is to try to break the control that David Koresh had over the minds of his people, what we'd like to do is with draw back slightly so that we're not increasing the pressure uh, within the compound and strengthening the hold that Mr. Koresh had on his followers. But it was not a tactical move to provoke any type of a fight. What about the issue of uh, your decision, uh, Mr. Jamar, to cut off the power inside the compound? Uh, did you believe that uh, the HRT agents in the field were cold and wet, and this is uh, somehow why the Davidians uh, should be the same at that time? Was that part of your decision making? Well, it was part of it, but I think the thing to remember, we cut the electricity off on the 9th, we cut the electricity off on the 10th. The idea was to, here's something we can do maybe to get some, a reaction from them, which we did. Uh, of course, never permitted classical quid pro quo negotiations. He didn't, would not involve himself in it and did not permit it. But that was the, what was going on. We had turned it back on. Well, that evening, um, morale and, 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 and uh, the coal was a factor. But remember, the reason we did it in the first place was also to use up their fuel. If they had generators, the sooner we use their fuel up, the, f the, the generators will stop and they can't use the fuel for Molotov cocktails. There's a lot of reasons for doing something. But that night, I first to tell you that when I, that the reason I did it that night primarily was for morale in one respect, not just, not just the tactical people, everybody who was out in cold and away from home and everybody else, but also that we're not as predictable as they may think. Now, did the negotiators like that? Not, not at all, because it was a departure for them. But I, it, it got us out of a box that, that. Well, what about the further decision to uh, play loud music, uh, the Tibetan chants and, and the rabbits uh, being slaughtered? Was this an escalation and was this consistent with the advice that Mr. Smerick had uh, given you? Well, I think uh, uh, Mr. Smerick was gone when we did that. We didn't do that until March 22nd. Mr. Smerick had a memorandum, one memorandum of his, where that was an option to consider. He did not specifically recommend that necessarily. But um, it was done at that time. I, I wouldn't uh, consider it um, relevant to any of his memoranda. Well, let me just say that it seems that there was a, a two-pronged approach here where you were uh, raising the temperature while your negotiators were trying to lower the temperature. And, and is that, and let me ask Mr. Sage his opinion, while these things were going on, did you think that th these were helpful things in your negotiations or hurtful? They were, uh, they presented difficulties for sure, but uh, that's not unusual. Uh, these are not matters that we were not prepared to, uh, to attempt to uh, negotiate through. Uh, it's not uncommon to, uh, as part of the negotiation process, to, to actually uh, try to ingratiate yourself a little bit more with the uh, with Korsh and, and uh, his followers by saying, look, this is out of our hands, but that's why you need to give us something to work with. I need to be able to go in to the on-scene commander and demonstrate some good faith progress here. Uh, that, that held true throughout this. Uh, it was not an overwhelming stumbling block, and it was not. Uh, something that was undertaken without us having uh, prior knowledge of it. Let me just quickly ask one last thing. Did you negotiate uh, your, uh, with each other or discuss uh, your negotiations on a daily basis? Constantly, all day. Constantly, all day? All shifts, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schiff, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kavanaugh, uh, you're with the... Uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms were at that time. Yes, sir. All right. Um, after, after the initial raid, which you have already described, did you become the initial negotiator with, the, with David Koresh and the Branch Davidians? Yes, Congressman, I did. And uh, for how long did that last? <clears throat> On February the 28th, I was the negotiator from 10 a.m. <clears throat> until I got the ceasefire and the wounded out at, at 1 o'clock. At 1 o'clock, I told David Koresh and Steve Schneider, I said, you're completely surrounded. This was not true, but I was stretching that a little bit. <laughs> I was stretching it a lot, really. But, but if, if, uh, just because time is short, if I can redirect you to the question. I'm sorry. For how long were you the chief, nego essentially the chief negotiator in this? I was the primary negotiator up and through Wednesday or Thursday. All right, and uh, who replaced you as negotiator? At night, the first, first person was uh, Gary Nesner at, at the table here. He replaced me uh, Sunday night at 2.30 or Monday morning at 2.30 a.m. Now, Mr. Nesner is with, with the uh, FBI, is that yes, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So that's at the point 
uh, several days later with the FBI then took over the negotiations with David Koresh. Yes, sir. They officially really took over, I'd say, Monday the next day, uh, directing operations, taking over the negotiations. Mr. Hartnett had come to me and told me that uh, the White House had directed that the FBI would take over the, the whole situation. And All right. When the White House directed that the FBI take over from ATF, uh, did you continue to participate in the negotiations, even though the FBI was now in charge of it? Yes, Congressman, I did. You, you continued to participate all the way through? Well, I, I stayed on the phone for uh, up to Thursday. I stayed on the negotiating team uh, up until Saturday. Uh, I had been transferred to Washington. Uh, once again, I had to move my personal goods. I was not on the phone speaking at that time. And so I left. I came back an for another stint of about seven to 10 days in uh, late March, early April. Okay. So you were always a participant in the, the negotiations? No, sir. Uh, a week, and then a break of a couple, three weeks, and then a week, I, I and then I wasn't there for the were, last. Were you two ever or three removed weeks. as a negotiator? Did the, did, the, did the FBI ever tell the ATF we don't want you involved anymore? No, sir. So always fully involved. Yes, sir. Did you believe that the that uh, were you aware that there were surrender plans being discussed with uh, Koresh uh, and the other people inside the compound by the lawyers as testified here to yesterday? Yes, sir. I did. I was aware. You knew about that. Mm -hmm. uh, in your opinion, were those serious plans for surrender? Well, Mr. Schiff, like I testified earlier, uh, I, I felt the, the best chance we had to get him out was on March the 2nd. And I, and I agree with Mr. Jamar. He tricked us. He fooled us. He played with us. I thought if he was coming out, that was the, the best time we were going to get him out. Fatigue. He was wounded. His blood pressure was down. I think he was playing more sick than he really was. But I thought we might have a chance at that point of getting getting him out. Uh, when what, I told Mr. Jamar not to let those attorneys in there, uh, I disagreed with that strongly. I, I, well, let, let me turn now to Mr. Jamar, if I may. Uh, Mr. Jamar, you aware of the, the surrender discussions between Koresh and the lawyers? Well, the surrender discussion was that I described earlier. That was the the week the weekend there of uh, the uh, late March, early April. Not the 14th. We're talking about two very distinct periods of time here. Well, the, specifically uh, in April, around April 14th, mm -hmm. the, the lawyers testified that they had reached an agreement for a surrender. Were you aware of that? Well, no. I think that was the, that was the implication of what they were saying, but that wasn't exactly it. What they agreed, what it was, was he was going to come out after he writes the manuscripts. An open-ended time, which they believed, if, if he was telling them the truth, would take two, a couple of days each, so they thought 10 or 12 days he would be coming out. All right, and, and did you convey to Mr. Sage as chief negotiator, or did, was Mr. Sage already aware, if you know, that there was at least a discussion of a surrender in 10 to 12 days as an estimate? Well, that, I, that's, I don't think you're saying it quite right, Mr. Schiff. I think the... Well, let, I'll let you say it then the way, okay, the it's, way it ought it's to be. Okay, it's make it clear er, earlier that this, all the surrender discussion, all the surrender plan discussion was done long before April 13th and 14th with them. It was the, when the lawyers were inside. They came out and, and, and then they were uh, on a high. He took it right away from them and then they left. We thanked them for a wonderful effort, taking their time, and that was it. Then Mr. DeGarren came up with the idea, having discussing with some, some scholars, some theological, religious scholars, that let's try this new angle with the, with the seals with him. Well, he, he gets on the phone with Koresh and presents that to him. Well, and Koresh question, goes for it and sends a letter ever, out. Excuse my interruption, it's only because time is short. I and understand. Questions. Was there ever a point that you felt that there was a serious uh, surrender discussion or offer being made? Did you ever take me, it Are you talking about in April with the lawyers? Um, that's what I'm talking about. Did you no. Ever, you, you I, I was serious on their mind. I think they were, they were earnest and, and really hopeful. But in, 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 in Coors's mind, never a chance. I'm sorry. All right. Mr. Chairman, uh, I see my time is about up. I just want to say that once again, we've heard some very powerful testimony at this hearing about the initial events and, and the uh, uh, shootout between the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms members and the people inside the compound. I just want to again say that on my part, and I think everybody else is here in both, both parties and the subcommittees, that all of us uh, support law enforcement. And all of us want to see that if there are and there will be dangerous situations in the future, 
that federal agents are not sent forward in inherently dangerous situations without proper planning and management and backup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Schiff. Uh, at this point, I'll recognize Ms. Lofgren for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'd uh, like to first apologize for not being here this morning. The Science Committee had a hearing at the exact same time on the Internet, which is of huge importance to my district and I would say uh, the future of the country. I was, um, I read through the various FBI reports and, and the like, and I was interested in the report on July 13th, Mr. Jamar, uh, I assume it's accurate, where you indicate that, um, and I guess it's page two, that uh, there had to be some method devised to remove individuals from the cam compound if, for example, it became apparent that children were being brutalized or had their lives endangered. I was wondering how much you knew or believed at that time uh, before the April 19th event as to the abuse of the children, the uh, child molestations ongoing, and how much that was a factor, even though it might not have been your direct jurisdiction, in, in factoring how to deal with this whole situation. Well, I think, the, as, as Mr. Sage uh, and, and Mr. Kavanaugh indicated, the children were upmost in everyone's mind all the time. The, uh, the information received when we arrived was that um, there were several instances of complaints by Porish of uh, severely disciplining infants to include paddling them to where they bled, and um, the other would be um, taking 10 and 12-year-old girls for his wife. In fact, one of the tapes they sent out, he had a group of his wives or potential wives sitting on the couch with their Star of David necklaces on. Uh, what we took from, from advice from, from behavioralists and, and others is that because he had that kind of conduct in the past, there's no reason for him to discontinue it during the siege. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some evidence we thought of him being involved with a child while we could hear on a microphone. We've been told that that was not the case. It was a preaching. But uh, Kathy Schroeder tells us, Kathy Schroeder is one of the people that came out and was a witness in the trial. Kathy Tr Schroeder tells us as she stuck her head in the door to say goodbye to Corish when he forced her to come out of the compound because she did not want to come. He was in bed with a, with a child, with a 10 or 12 year old little girl. So it was, but we didn't know that then is my point. We know it now. Well, I'm wondering what you knew but, at but the But what time. that does to me is confirms the belief that if he had that kind of conduct in the past, it would continue during the siege, and it did, apparently. Well, what I'm trying to probe, I'll tell you, uh, trying to think back to just what my neighbors, I, I'm a fresh person. I've only been in the Congress now seven months, I guess, and, and uh, like a lot of other Americans in 1993, my neighbors were, you know, opining what should happen. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that I recall people in the neighborhood and in the town I lived in asking was why, why not just wall them up and leave them alone? How much, and how much was it costing a day for the taxpayers to keep this siege on going? I, I'd like to know how much was it costing per day and were there good reasons for not simply withdrawing and letting them sit there for a year or, or more? Well, there's lots of reasons not to withdraw. Here we've got four dead ATF agents and people who are armed. Um, the other is that if we leave those people in, particularly the children, to him to do what he pleases with the conditions in there, forget the danger level, forget the possibility of gunfire inside there. It is the, the sanitary conditions, because the place was not made for, I, I just don't think that was, that was feasible. Let me ask you this. You have mentioned that you had um, a lot of input from experts in um, behavioral sciences, and I was wondering, you had conflicting information. Uh, we had a, a gentleman testify yesterday about the need to understand the biblical context mm -hmm. in which they were operating, which I agree with. Uh, he analogized it to, to somebody who spoke a different language. You would have somebody who could negotiate with them in their language, and I think that's sensible. But I'm wondering what kind of, how did you assimilate the various diverse pieces of information you were getting to make the soundest judgment you could as to strategy? Well, I'm, your observation about being able to relate and stuff like that, maybe you don't always want to do that. I may, may ask Mr. Nestor to, to give you the, the philosophy of negotiation when you have someone who has a deep belief system. I might ask him to describe that to you. But the, um, each component 
each shift of the, of the negotiators would report interesting or significant events. No, but and all that was con I don't continued. want to We have very short yeah. time. I don't yeah. want to be rude. But I'm not suggesting that we necessarily should negotiate with someone who is psychotic in their terms, but we, to the extent possible, we should try and understand what that person thinks is going on. I think is one, that not correct? I think one of the great misunderstandings of this is there's implications that the FBI totally discounted Mr. Koresh's religious perspectives, and I think nothing could be further from the truth. If you listen to the hours upon hours of tape, we listened uh, to David Koresh's uh, theology and his points of view. We never tried to tell him that, uh, that we understood that to the level that he did. But there's two consistent themes that you'll hear from every mental health expert uh, that knows anything about crisis intervention, crisis negotiation, and that is that you neither embrace someone's belief system nor you do you discount it. No, see, I I'm, guess I'm not making myself clear. I am not suggesting, because I'm not a negotiator, mm -hmm. how the negotiations should have been conveyed. I'm more interested in the internal process of how the negotiating experts came to understand the behavior and the likely future behavior of this individual who some believe was, and I personally am not a uh, physician, but appears to have been psychotic in addition to being engaged in mm -hmm. a, a rather strange a religious uh, cult and how you assimilated this information so that you could make the best tactical decisions based on your understanding of his <coughs> outlook on life. What I, what I think I was trying to get to is, is we, we learned from listening to David Koresh and uh, for many hours to try to understand the individual we were dealing with and we did not believe that he was psychotic or out of touch with reality. He manifested primarily those attributes of an antisocial personality. That's a con man, an egotistical, uh, self-centered individual who manipulated people and events for his own personal gain and who callously disregarded uh, his naive and gullible followers. That's how we read David Koresh. Now, we didn't confront him with that, but we tried to employ techniques that would help us better understand him and to provide him with the alternative that he felt would be in his best interest and we gave him numerous options throughout uh, the negotiation process to take advantage of all sorts of opportunities. Whatever concerns he had, we met. They were concerned about being able to return to the compound because the inhabitants had given up their worldly goods. We went out over the press conference. We went in on paper saying that the compound would not be confiscated. Uh, he was concerned about being able to continue his ministry in prison. We provided documentation from the, from the United States Attorney's Office, from the uh, uh, from the sheriff and from the SAC saying, you will be allowed to meet with your followers in prison. Uh, we sent them in videotapes of the children who had been released. We made uh, transmitted messages to and from relatives. Whatever the needs or desires that they had, we undertook extraordinary methods to try to comply with those so that David Koresh would understand that he'll be treated fairly and with dignity. He'll have his opportunity to, to speak his piece and present his perspective on events in, in the public uh, uh, forum as well as in the court of law, and yet despite those efforts, um, he chose not to do it out of his own self-interest. I, I think that's an important point. My time is up, but very quickly, I did ask how much per day the siege was costing, and I wonder if you have a figure. If anybody could answer that, uh, you may do so. I'm sorry, I don't how have How much per day did the siege cost? You don't know. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I don't know. All right, well, we probably can get that somewhere else, Ms. Lofgren. Thank you very much. Mr. Shabbat, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jamar. Um, Following up with Mr. Uh, Schiff's line of questioning, uh, did you tell Mr. Sage about the Daguerrean Arnold uh, uh, agreement, so to speak, with Koresh? Did you pass that on to him? He was with us uh, when we were every, all the time we spent with Mr. Daguerrean in transporting him back and forth. Byron was there also when we had him on the phone. Uh, we, Byron was there when he got the. He learned Mr. Of it the Sage same day. was there, so so he, he learned of it the same okay. day. Yes. Mr. Sage, did you pass that information on to anyone? Absolutely. At the end of, uh, of each shift, uh, we would have a uh, summary of, of the events of that, uh, which we referred to as significant events, which would be documented for briefing the next shift that came on. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, I didn't wait that long. As soon as we came back from that meeting, because of the potential value of, of, this, uh, of this situation, we discussed it thoroughly amongst the negotiation team, the team leaders, the team coordinator, who at that time had shifted from uh, uh, Mr. Nessner to uh, Clint Van Zandt. So was, everyone knew basically that that uh, this agreement or or whatever you want to call it between Koresh and yourselves had been made. 
the concept was thoroughly discussed. What, what needs to be kept in context is that this really was not a, a major departure. In fact, we had the, the concept, as I recall, uh, was addressed uh, at least uh, the very early stages of it as I was transporting uh, Mr. DeGaren and Mr. Zimmerman uh, to a meeting. And we tried to press them for, uh, I tried to press them for a, a basic time frame. And it was at that time when they mentioned that they were talking about, and I recall, two to three days per seal. Uh, well, at that rate, two to three days would be 14 to 21 days at the outside. Okay. So it, we embraced that aspect of it as well in the negotiations to try to keep a, an update as to, to progress. Okay, thank you. M Mr. Smerick, let me ask you a couple of questions. The, the FBI turned to you for professional, uh, psychological, and strategic advice during the course of the siege, is that correct? Uh, that is correct, sir. Okay, and you provided the FBI with guidance through a series of uh, reports or memoranda? Yes, sir, during the first week of my stay in Waco, Texas. Okay, and in the memoranda, you stress the need to try to ensure the safety of children, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And as I understand it, in your first series of memorandas, I, I believe the, the first four, um, you essentially suggested a waiting strategy. Uh, and you urged the FBI, in fact, to back away from the House. Is that right? That is correct. So the, the strategy that you were emphasizing was wait at that wait point. Wait and be patient. Okay. Wait and be patient. Um, now, you believed, and here I think I'm quoting you, that increased pressure on Koresh could eventually be counterproductive and could result in loss of life. Correct? And, yes, sir. And you believe that, I, I assume? Yes. Okay. Now, however, in the last memo, uh, you suddenly recommended new measures, including cutting off negotiations. And that seemed to be a fairly dramatic uh, change in, in the tone of the memoranda at that time. Is, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. I'd like to quote to you uh, something from the uh, Washington Times. Um, this says that uh, the memos urged, just referring to your memos, uh, urged the FBI supervisors to wait Koresh out, saying increased pressure could eventually be counterproductive and could result in loss of life, which we've just discussed. Then it goes on to say, Mr. Smerick, now retired, said FBI officials pressured him to change his advice on how to resolve the situation. And in a fifth memo, he made changes that amounted to an endorsement of the FBI raid. Um, could you explain that? Did you feel pressure from the FBI? Not uh, overt pressure. It was more of a self-imposed uh, pressure. Uh, I had received information from FBI headquarters that FBI officials were not happy with the tone of my memos from the standpoint that they felt it was tying their hands, meaning they were not going to be able to increase any type of pressure within that compound, and instead were going to have to rely on strictly negotiations. No one at FBI headquarters at any time uh, told me or directed me that, hey, write different memos. But the analogy I like to give is one of um, uh, perhaps a youngster who's been admonished by a parent or has just a finger waved at him. Um, we all have a tendency of wanting to please our supervisors, and I believe what I did subconsciously is tone down my memo in memo number five to more or less fall, fall in line with what they would want to hear. So it was not any pressure from the FBI. It was pressure from myself to become more of a team player. To become more of a team player? Right. Okay. Was there anyone in particular that wasn't pleased uh, with the tone of the memoranda? No name was mentioned to me other than the, uh, the director of the FBI was not happy, but it was made in passing. Who, who told you that? Uh, John Douglas, who was my unit chief uh, down at Quantico. John Douglas? Thank you. Okay. While that may appear uh, in memo number five to be a dramatic change in um, philosophy on my part, you might also notice in the earlier memos which I had prepared, meaning the one on the 7th of March, I had made similar recommendations at that particular time for consideration. 
so in reality what i said in the very last memo was not in reality a dramatic departure from what i had said earlier the bottom line is uh, for fifty one days the f b i did not ignore my memos and in fact followed many of the suggestions and recommendations which i had provided but, but you clearly felt um, particularly early on that it was important uh, particularly for the safety of the children uh, that the strategy should be wait and, and not move at that time. Is oh, that absolutely. Right? And the FBI, in fact, did not move uh, at that particular time and for the longest period of time went over and beyond what normal negotiators might consider doing in a situation like this. In my experience in the past of working with negotiators in similar crises, uh, for instance, the idea of bringing in attorneys to deal with the offender is unheard of the idea of bringing in religious experts to discuss the matter with the offender is unheard of and yet the FBI considered all of these particular options and so the newspaper article that you're referring to is not exactly accurate in its portrayal of my my sentiment the FBI did not ignore my memos and in fact they did in fact follow many of the suggestions I had made Mr. Stabbett, your time has expired Mr. Watt you're recognized for five minutes Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield my five minutes to Mr. Conyers. I want to thank my colleague for yielding to me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, our distinguished member of judiciary, Ms. Lofgren, came in and apologized for being away from the hearing. And it, it really touched me. I, I come and uh, apologize for being at the hearings. Uh, this thing has taken up days and days of, of my life. Uh, she wanted to know how much money we spent on the siege. I'll find out how much money, and I'm going to find out how much money we spent on these hearings. Uh, we've got uh, all kind of problems in America. This thing could have been done in about half the time at least. And although there have been good things that have come out of it, I, I can tell you, and I know you can't tell by the tone of my voice, I'm really getting tired of this stuff. But this is my job, and I'm, I'm here, and I'll do it. Mr. Kavanaugh, you stated earlier that you felt that the ATF sounded like pop guns compared to the Davidians' cameras, uh, uh, cannons. Is that right? Yes, sir. Is there any need for me to ask you to elaborate on that? or what? what what, what's behind that? I think the only point, Congressman, there is that <coughs> the, uh, you should know and the, and the members should know that the 9 millimeter guns that the uh, ATF agents brought to that scene <coughs> were done for a purpose. We knew there was a lot of children in there. We knew there was a lot of women and innocents in there, and, and that's been discussed by various members. We, we never alleged that everyone in there was a criminal uh, in, in our search warrant affidavit. That was not the case. And with all these innocents in there, our teams, our special teams, took mostly 9 millimeter firearms that they knew wouldn't penetrate those walls, they knew wouldn't go through and hit innocent children. And so, in essence, the beating we took was because we were trying not to have firearms that would go through the walls. That's the only point I would make. Very good. Thank you. Uh, nice meeting you, Mr. Jamar. Uh, You've taken a lot of knocks here in your absence over the days uh, about this hearing from not only witnesses, but members uh, here in the committee. And uh, I'm glad to meet you and welcome you here. Thank you. I think you did a good job under the circumstance. How did the range and assortment of the Davidians' weaponry affect the, your options in ending the siege? The weapons we learned of when we first arrived were the dozens of automatic weapons. The fear of a 50 caliber machine gun, it turned out to be two 50 calibers with 10 shot magazines. They were, it was not a machine gun. Those 50 calibers produced uh, a lot of concern for us, um, created a lot of concern for us. It made us um, be extremely careful to avoid provocation of any kind. We would, if they would have had mere 22s, we'd have had the same attitude about provocation. But the peril that the agents were in was magnified by a great 
degree because of the one automatic gunfire that that presents and the power of a 50 caliber. 50 caliber is anti-aircraft. That's the power we're talking about. So mm -hmm. that caused us great concern. Uh, one of the great How far does a 50 caliber go? I think from uh, our place up the street to here. It'd be pretty good. Uh, what's that? Ten blocks. Almost half a mile? I think uh, maybe for some people it's say 3,000 yards. But I think, a, I think it could be shot ten blocks that way you concern. Okay. Um, so it's, it's because the arsenal of machine guns or whatever they were in hand grenades that the FBI was forced to use armored personnel carriers around the compound. Yes, sir. We wouldn't have been there without them. Mm -hmm. Mr. McCarthy, you were tactical leader of the Los Angeles County Police Department SWAT team. And uh, my staff prepared the question, the premier SWAT team in the country. And uh, believe me, with Maxine Waters was here, uh, she wouldn't let me say that. And uh, I don't. I'm reading the staff prepared question. Uh, for 13 years, and as the leader of that team, did you ever have the occasion to order the use of uh, CS gas? And, and did your department ever use CS gas uh, on an occasion where people not known criminals were present? Yes, sir. Uh, we used CS gas on numerous occasions. I personally over 200, uh, always with uh, a positive resolution where the CS gas even when used in extremely heavy concentrations, probably heavier than existed at Waco in a few circumstances. Uh, and in those incidents, uh, nobody was injured from the tear gas. And as far as I know, no one has ever died of a concentration of CS gas. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one of the things I've learned uh, since the last time the Judiciary Committee held hearings on this subject. Because when General Reno was here, uh, we were talking about poison gas and, uh, you know, uh, the whole idea, it, it was not understood what this was. And so I want to tell you, I've, I've learned a lot about uh, CS gas and tear gas and all of its variations on the theme. Uh, you've then used uh, this kind of gas in enclosed spaces as an apartment. And are you aware of any uh, severe injuries? And uh, do you have an opinion of the safety of CS gas? And what about the ABC error about the manual that states CS, when CS gas is supposed to be uh, used? Uh, first of all, I am not aware of anybody who has been uh, uh, either killed or severely injured and overcome. I happen to be personally an asthmatic, and I've been in CS gas hundreds of times myself personally. What about that lawyer that was here yesterday that kept telling everybody to take a trip out to Quantico and take a whiff if you think that it's uh, not? I mean, I, I, I shouldn't be reminding people of that testimony because yesterday was not a good day for me in these hearings. But uh, wh where, do, where do people get this for the American people either? The, uh, the fact is that uh, tear gas is extremely uncomfortable, will cause uh, tremendous mucus flow, saliva flow, and your eyes will water severely and you want to keep them shut. Uh, it's very uncomfortable. There's no question of that, but uh, it does not kill people. Uh, the study that was done uh, regarding uh, cubic feet and the amount of gas per cubic feet uh, has been disclaimed twice, once in 1991 and once in 1993 by the organization that authored it. Uh, it uh, was authored in 1969, and the International <laughs> Association of Chiefs of Police disclaimed that study and advised tear gas companies in their periodicals to uh, uh, refrain from using it because it was outdated. Fired the time for Mr. Watt. Mr. Thank Sauter. you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Mr. Souter, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, quick question, Mr. McCarthy. Has the LAPD ever uh, killed an under 10 in a confined area? Uh, we have not gassed children, as far as I know. However, in the similar circumstance, uh, in a 51-day circumstance, I would not okay. be in a uh, disagreement. I just with wanted to establish that in the 200 incidents, there were not children in a confined area. Is that correct? No, sir. We ha didn't have that kind of an yes, incident. I understand that. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Jamara. I'm, I'm actually confused, and I don't have a, a firm opinion. I want to get a clarification. Um, 
In the tapes on March 4th, um, it's been alleged that David Koresh was the person who initially called about the milk, or did the FBI suggest the milk? Did David Koresh ask for milk? Um, the report here says the FBI offered milk in return. Uh, did Koresh initiate the milk request? I think so, yes. And, and did, uh, was this on the tapes, let's get her, that's Heather Jones, out, and then we'll send you the milk? I'm sorry, would you repeat? Um, there was noise behind me. I couldn't hear you. Let's get her out and then let me send you the milk. In other words, the core question here is, is that the FBI offered milk in return for the release of some children. Right. Yesterday we heard that um, Koresh believed that the promise was violated because that, and that the tapes suggest that there is the phrase, now it may be other phrases in it too, let's get her out and then let me send you the milk. Well, that was an effort to, this is, remember, March 4th. It's an effort to establish a quid pro quo and an exchange here. And the next day she came out, Heather Jones. It was, but uh, it was an effort to get that done. She did come out, but that exchange was an effort by the negotiator to establish that type of relationship and, and, uh, and to communicate with Koresh. So do you believe that then not sending the milk after she came out the next day gave Koresh some reason to doubt uh, whether or not you were going to follow through on the negotiated deal. You don't believe that was a negotiated deal, send her out and we'll send you milk? I don't think it was at all. He chose to let her go for his reasons. Um, he never could involve himself in the quid pro quo. I think that's out of context. I, I don't believe we ever made a deal with Mr. Koresh that we didn't follow through on. Uh, and, and Mr. Jamar is right. In, in a classic hostage situation, which this was not, and we've never characterized it as such, although others have, in a classic situation like that, the individual holding the hostages is doing so to compel the authorities to fulfill a demand. We didn't have that situation here whatsoever. So it was very difficult for us to make these quid pro quo agreements with David Koresh. But what we would do is he would, uh, we would do some act of uh, positive nature, send in milk or do send in a tape or whatever it might be, and occasionally he would do something positive in return. But uh, you couldn't pin him down on making a firm promise for a firm act of good faith on our part. I'm, I'm still a little confused, and I may ask some uh, written questions afterwards, but it helps some. I want to yield the balance of my time to Chairman McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sage, you said earlier uh, that in a discussion with Mr. DeGarren about the agreement on the written seals, the interpretation of the seals, that he indicated to you that it would take 20 days, approximately two or three days per seal to do this. When did he <coughs> have this conversation with you? When? Was this on the 14th of April, or was it before that, about the writing of the, of the interpretation of the seals and it that it would take two or three days per interpretive letter? My recollection is that it was approximately the 14th. I don't know specifically, but that's a general time frame. Mr. Jamar, what I want to know from you on this very same type of point is that you have given us an indication that uh, you were aware of all of this going on. You really didn't have any confidence that uh, Koresh would ever come out. Uh, but that this seal interpretation writing was to take place. You've also told us that there was no evidence over the weekend of the, the last two days before this uh, last assault occurred that any progress was being made uh, on the writing of these. At any time, did you ever indicate to Mr. DeGarren that between the 14th when this whole arrangement was being discussed and the writings were to occur, that there wasn't going to be 20 days, uh, or that if he, th he didn't show some progress, if he didn't bring one of them out within a couple of days, that was going to be the end of it. In other words, did you give him any indication, Mr. DeGarren, that his client didn't have any real time to do this in, or had to show some good faith by producing something immediately? Well, I think the, the idea of producing it uh, was clear to us both, that we expected something. They used two to three days for each one. We expected some progress in the next two or three days. But you never told Mr. DeGarren that if it didn't happen, it was all over, or well, something, was, I, something else was going to happen. Well, I didn't know something else was going to happen. Well, you did at some point. Well, I did the 17th. I'm not going to call Mr. DeGarren and tell him we have an operational plan. We're going no, to execute on Monday. I would expect you to the operational plan, but I would have expected you, knowing you didn't have any faith in this to begin with, didn't believe in it to begin with, that you would have at least given him some indication that his client, you know, better hurry up and produce something now uh, because we're not sitting around here for 20 days on this. You ought to know it's highly improbable we're going to spend 20 days sitting around here waiting for him to produce one of these things. Uh, did you ever make that clear to I him that kind of I don't think it had to be fashion? that emphatic. 
I think he knew that. Uh, he didn't uh, indicate that to us yesterday by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, he indicated to us quite the contrary yesterday. He indicated that he was deeply disappointed and that he would consider himself greatly deceived by you had uh, he, he learned what apparently he is now learning today that all along you didn't uh, you didn't really expect this to happen and he didn't have it. He thought this was a commitment. I mean, that's what he said. I don't know well, I, the I merit saw, of this. I'm not trying to prejudge it. I saw the testimony. I know, he, I know what he said. And, it, and it was, he's been quoted in saying that in the past in, in the media where he said that I said there's plenty of time. And there would have been plenty of time if there had been some production. We would have stayed. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have done what we did on the 19th well, but again, had there been some production. Again, my point is you didn't really hammer that home to him. You said you didn't need to know that. You thought that was a given. Obviously, there was a miscommunication here in some form or fashion, or at least it seemed to me. Let me ask one last question while we're involved in this area, area altogether. Uh, with regard to releasing people, there has been some question about uh, that that was made by Mr. DeGarrett and Mr. Zimmerman yesterday and a couple of the others, I think maybe Mr. Tabor, uh, that I believe, Mr. Jamar, you indicated that when one of the witnesses, or one of the Davidians, I think uh, Kathy Schroeder was, was let out early, you played the tape uh, back in. Maybe Mr. Sage indicated that. Uh, with her relating how uh, the things were going all right for her and so on. That was pretty early on in this. Uh, that was in, in March, correct? Mid-March. And, and, and what I'm getting at in my question is that Mr. DeGarren, or Mr. Zimmerman, I've forgotten which, Mr. Tabor, I think, corroborated, indicated that along the way, end of March, April, whatever, uh, that there was some, some witnesses, some, uh, I mean, some uh, people who had been in that compound who came out, not witnesses, but Davidians, who uh, were put in jail who were not given the kind of freedom that one would have right. expected them maybe them to be, that everybody, I think they said everybody that came out was put in jail, uh, that they were separated from their children, that the Child Protective Services got the children, and that this was a bad message going back in there. Now, would you care to respond to that? Please. Uh, the first two people who were released were elderly ladies, first two adults, excuse me, were elderly ladies. They were charged with capital murder. I complained to the U.S. Attorney, and they changed it to material witness warrants. It was a horrible message sent back. But they still kept them in jail. I don't know how long they stayed in jail. I don't think they stayed in jail for, for very long, those two ladies. Uh, I could be mistaken, but I think it's worth checking into. I don't think they were in jail that long. I think they got out. Now, the other adults who came out were held on material witness war warrants thereafter and were held in jail. Now, there was never parents and children out together, never. So never were parents and children separated by, by uh, the authorities. There was never an instance where a parent and child came out together. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Ms. Jackson Lee, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I want to thank the witnesses for being here uh, today and uh, some very important issues. I think we've already heard testimony isolating uh, the actions of Mr. Koresh as being plainly antisocial behavior and antisocial personality. But I imagine as these hearings are unfolding, particularly for you gentlemen, the American people might wonder again, and we've, we've heard this question queried to you and asked, why didn't you wait? They might be asking that question. I think they also should know that about 34 persons went out on your clock up until about March 23rd, that people were coming out. They were abandoning the circumstances. And Mr. Jamar, I'm going to ask this question to you. You might want to say that, how many came out. But I do want you to, to again for us, uh, or give me, why we moved from the negotiating posture of trust and calmness, and we want to work with you, uh, to the position of stress, heightening the stress, creating adversity. Um, and I want to ask my other question as well afterward. You've been in the FBI, you'll tell me for how many years. I know you're a senior member of the I FBI. Retired, when I retired, I was 25 and a half years. 25 and a half years. 25 and a half mm -hmm. years. This is a very large nation. Would you imagine in your service that there are a variety of groups living in different ways, whether they happen to be pacifists or whether they happen to be people who are environmentalists living in uh, very rugged conditions across this nation? And I would ask you as to whether or not your understanding is that they still live in peace uh, across this nation, although they may be different, and we may not even know of their existence or the fact that they're there. You may know it, and I'd like to ask that question. I'll have that, those two questions answered before I move to Mr. Neshman. Yeah, the, let me answer the second one first, if it's okay. I think there's plenty of groups of people who are living together in peace and doing just fine. The difficulty is when you and ask... And they're different. 
they're, they're far different, different they're, from... They could be growing different food and then doing whatever, totally odd behavior. They're totally um, uh, foreign to most people. The difference between this group and all others is this was a group of people who were absolutely devoted to a person who would abuse everything about them, who would abuse religion to, for his end to, to suit any purpose he wanted. He would abuse any of their assets, any of their family members, any of them to serve him. And what he had, absolute devotion. And when that devotion faltered, or if you didn't follow discipline, out the door you went. And that's the way he controlled things. And that was it. That's the difference between this group and 99.9 of .9 the others, I pray. I hope there's, I don't, this is, so, this is absolutely extraordinary control here. I like to think that these type of groups are extremely rare and uh, we won't run into people like this. We've again. already established the enormous number of weapons mm -hmm. that were in the compound. Mm -hmm. I wish you were here yesterday with the lawyers. The balance would have added to our understanding. Because the question becomes, um, why did the other individuals who were with their faculty, they uh, were trained and educated people, did not separate or distinguish themselves from this gentleman, Mr. David Koresh, who the documents reinforce over and over this bizarre personality and bizarre attitude and actions. Why couldn't they get separated? And how come you couldn't reach through to that component of the, uh, of the compound? I think Steve, Stephen Snyder is a perfect example of, your, of the person that you described. He's a highly educated person with a master's degree in religion. He's a, I think he was um, uh, a successful person as, as ability to su support himself. Married to Judy Snyder. Comes to, he, he's recruited by Koresh in Hawaii. He leaves Hawaii to come to live in these conditions. In fact, he talked about it during the negotiations. He said, you think you gave up something? I came here from Hawaii. So he was very conscious of all that. But he gave up not only his, his, his life to come there, he gave up his wife to Koresh. They were unable to have children together. He admitted that. Yes. He, he and Judy were unable to have children together. She had a child by Koresh. I mean, that, it's the, the degree of devotion by this man who is highly educated, a successful person by any, anybody's measure. He gave himself totally. And we worked on him and worked on him and worked on him. There was an instance where I had an occasion afterwards to talk to his sisters on a television program. And they asked me, why didn't we let them talk to him? And I said, when's the last time you saw him? Did he come home? Were you able to convince him to stay? And they said, no. I want the American people yeah. to know that you made those individual separate inquiries because it is a question why we move from stress to then, from, uh, rather from trust to stress. But you did make an effort to get to individuals to separate them out. And I do want to move quickly to my next question. Okay. I, I think you've made that point, Mr. Nessner. I am going to try to ask you a question on that matter. As we move toward the CS gas determination, I think Mr. McCarthy has indicated that the gas does not kill. Um, is that what you just said, Mr. McCarthy? The gas did not kill? That's correct. Um, it is frightening, however. Gas, people attribute explosions and tragically fire. Uh, Mr. Jamar, a simple question. Did you want those people to come out alive? Absolutely. In terms of the CS gas and its decision to use it and utilize it, did you have an architectural understanding of the location or the structure of that building and were you all prepared to isolate out, isolate out people, excuse me, and get them out? Did we have the routes out for them to come so that you could effectively be looking for these people to be pouring out at the time of the gas being inserted? And how would that track with the bulldozers going in? Okay, the, the, the premise of the delivery of the gas first was to the corner of the compound. There's not a picture up there now, but every, I think everybody has this, this image in their head on the, what we call- If someone can put the picture the, up, I'd the, appreciate the, it. The red green corner is where we started. The, the, the premise of the plan was to deliver that gas there. And the idea was gas is in your compound. We're, we're going to make your compound uninhabitable. And then we're going to back away. But when they fired upon the first tank, only one tank approached. The, we had put concert team Give me the wire. sound it makes. The fired upon, can you make the sound? I'm sorry, the, the automatic gunfire was piercing at the, at the tank as it as rolled up. As they became up. up. That's as it drove up. What that did was cause us to deliver gas in the whole compound, particularly the tower, to try to take that part away. But the plan was to make the building uninhabitable. And with the, this is the type of stuff, if it gets on, let's say, a loaf of bread or a, a milk bottle or glass or anything, and you, it just stirs up all the time. It just, it just never goes away. The, 
plan, we expected to do that for 48 hours. We didn't expect that we expect some to come out immediately. We expect it would take us 48 hours to contaminate the whole place if they didn't respond to us. Of course, if they would have said, stop, we want to come out, that would have been the end of the gassing right there. That would have been the end of it right there. Thank you. Time has expired. Mr. Micah, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, just one thing, and I want to keep the record always clear. I heard somebody on the other side of the aisle, and when you get involved with a bunch of attorneys, you have to make sure you keep the record straight. I'm not an attorney. I passed this out yesterday, and it deals with the law, and I read the law as it is in, in, um, in Texas relating to, uh, to a, uh, use of force uh, in arrests in, in Texas. I did not comment on it. I asked the Tex Texas Rangers what, in fact, if that was the law, and they replied in the affirmative. Then I quoted sir, from... Uh, from the report of um, the Treasury Department, their conclusion, certainly an armed assault by 100 agents had to be seen as an attack independent of who fired the first shot. Not my commentary. I have never said that there is any justification for the, the killing of four ATF agents or, and wounding of others, and I want to make that perfectly clear. Uh, and I'll see anybody outside who disputes me on those facts. Mr. Kavanaugh, let's go through. You were, uh, you were this morning very emotionally describing your participation. I want to get to some of the points leading up to your participation. You, and I have this, uh, this memo uh, relating to your comments at a Waco administrative review that was done in November after all this occurred. First meeting you attended in December of 92 uh, you had said to Sarabin, you'll have to negotiate this one. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Pretty much? Uh, second meeting, uh, you stressed two main points. You need to negotiate with Koresh if at all possible, and two, remove Koresh and his top five lieutenants from the compound if at all possible. Those were your recommendations, correct? Yes, sir. And then you, uh, you said... A ruse could be used to get Koresh and his top followers outside the compound, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, then you were taken away from this. This is the second meeting, and you came back, and you were, well, when you left, you left with the impression that the Houston uh, division had decided uh, to siege the compound. Is that correct? When you I were left, left that with that impression. Yes, Congressman. Then in January, uh, you were very surprised to learn a new turn of events, uh, that they changed their plan and that Serban had said he had new information and they were going to use a different approach. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, then you said that, that you, read, uh, you read the plans and it said there was no provision for a negotiator, uh, as you had originally stressed, and two, there was only one public information officer assigned to the plan. Were those your objections? Yes, sir. All right. Then Kavanaugh... Uh, you later raised questions. You said uh, you were concerned because only different bits of information were given at different meetings. It was conceivable that one would have received more information on the types and numbers of, of guns at one briefing. That was one of your concerns, wasn't it? Uh, I'm sorry, Congressman. As I recall, it was the types and uh, uh, bits of information at meetings. But we didn't know, you didn't know exactly the, the, this quantity, this vast a quantity of weapons that were available and to be used against you was one of your concerns. Uh, or you said it might have been at different meetings and, and okay. not everybody had the full picture. Okay. I don't recall it exactly. I'm sorry. And then you asked also, uh, uh, I think you urged Serban to call a thing, uh, to, well, to call a thing off, and, and Serban wanted to proceed on Saturday, uh, but he said the helicopters weren't ready and that the training was not complete. That's Saturday night before the raid, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, I always only felt this should be negotiated. The, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. And the morning of the raid, uh, it's not like this. The uh, Waco Times had already done the story, right? Yes, sir. And you were concerned about this, right? Yes, sir. I've and the morning of the raid, wasn't that uh, you were in this observation thing. Didn't you see newspaper, more newspaper and media activity? In fact, I think you identified a Waco Times uh, 
uh, vehicle right in, in, near the front door of the compound. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then you said that uh, the decisions were ongoing. Uh, wait, you said the go versus no go go was in the hands of Wenaki and headquarters. Further, furthermore, uh, Serban told you the discussions were ongoing between ATF headquarters and the Treasury and said that he felt as if uh, his, that your input did not matter since the decision making was uh, proceeding at a much higher level than, than your level. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That, that would have been not Sunday morning. That would have been uh, probably more Friday and Saturday. Well, uh, all right. We'll uh, go on from that. Uh, you were also concerned that uh, that there was bad information from uh, Rodriguez. Is that correct? Concerned it was bad information. Yes, that that uh, that uh, Rodriguez wasn't giving a good information. At every, what I'm trying to say is, at every point, you express concerns about this. Yes, sir. I, I can elaborate if you like. I, I did. Then. Uh, when you found out that 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 uh, this had been, you know, sort of a media event too that got out of hand, that uh, in fact that uh, the press, uh, Miss Wheeler and some of the others, there were media out in the front of the place. You said, uh, and this is you. You said that everyone at the undercover house was wondering whether the raid would be called off. Is that was that your comments that morning? Yes, sir. I think there's varying degrees of of, of apprehension that we felt. Uh, in, in the undercover house and uh, the other thing sir you know I'm only sent here temporarily to find out what went on mm -hmm. with government resources personnel agents we're not here to get anybody we just want to find out what I, we never even made a statement that that these reports were you know were false or anything Mr. Hartnett though who was overseeing a lot of this operation talked about this report this inside uh, Treasury report and it said that that report was filled with distortions, omissions, and in some cases, things that were simply untrue. I believe it was done for political reasons. The politics of the situation became more important than the people involved, and then he resigned. Mm -hmm. He said that. I didn't say that. These people on this side of the panel didn't say it. This is the Treasury agent in charge of the whole situation. What, what do you think? Who's, who's responsible? Mr. Here? Congressman, I, I can only speak to the Treasury report as it, as it addresses my role. And, and I feel like they were candid and fair with me. I can tell you that they were extremely grueling in talking to them. I mean, it was very rough. They left no stone unturned in my situation. And I felt like they, they, they portrayed my role fairly. And that's all I can say. I thank you. Uh, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, you want to be recognized for five minutes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Mr. Condit for working with me on this. Gentlemen, a lot has been made uh, by some people on, in this room about the use of CS gas, especially when there were older people and, and children present. But as one of the earlier witnesses said today, David Koresh got rational people to do totally irrational things. They would give their wives to him. They would they would give their wives to Koresh. They would give everything they owned to Koresh. They would let him have sex with their very young children. Then it would follow that Koresh could have told these people, get up and walk out. And they would have listened, wouldn't they? Isn't there becoming, at least I seem to be noticing more and more, a case where people who do despicable things have increasingly started surrounding themselves with innocence as human shields? And isn't it accurate to say that Koresh kept little kids and old women and old men around him as human shields? It, well, I'll answer that. I, I don't, he kept people around to be, to, for, his, for his personal use. The shields was, was the appropriate time to use a shield, he used them as a shield. If it was something else, he'd use them for that. But I, I'd like everyone else regret the death of those young people and those old people. But the bottom line is, if that man had had a shred of courage, a shred of decency, he could have told them to walk out. At any time? At any time. For 51 days, let the record show that that coward could have turned to those children and said, leave. 
you're in danger here. He could have turned to the old people and said, leave, you're in danger here. Sir, he chose not to do so. Uh, Koresh could not have done that because not only were the children shields for him, he recognized the fact that he was the father of those children. The mothers of those children were under age when they gave birth, which means with DNA testing, it can be proven that he had carnal knowledge of women who were underage. He knew that if he came out of that particular compound, he was not going to prison as a religious martyr who defended his religious faith. He was going to prison as an individual who was a child molester. That is one reason why I believe, under no circumstances, was David Koresh going to surrender and come out of that compound alive. Thank you for, for adding Taylor, that. Could I add something to that, please? Absolutely. And that is, uh, I think there's a misunderstanding that's occurred today about there only being a few occasions where specific surrender discussions took place. And I think the record should show, if anyone really listens to those negotiation tapes, uh, the hundreds of hours of tapes, Koresh represented day in, day out, that in fact he was coming out. It was a rare occasion where he would say, I'm not coming out. Almost every day he said he was coming out. He just simply didn't do it. So for him to represent to the attorneys or to represent to us throughout, this was hardly uh, brand new information. He'd been saying to this, this to us every single day. I want to, since I know my time is running out and it is a rather large panel, I'm going to ask you the same question I've asked every other panel. And it's that you've had, we've all had now two years of hindsight. And many of you were there on scene. Has anything that you've seen, anything you've read, anything that you've heard justify the murder of those four ATF agents, Conway LeBlu, Todd McKeehan, Robert Williams, Stephen Willis, and the, and the wounding of 20 more by David Koresh and his followers? Has anything that you've seen justified that? Because even the two defense, criminal defense attorneys yesterday who first said, yeah, it was justified, when I asked them which one of these agents should have died, they backpedaled real fast. So is there anything that you gentlemen have seen that justifies their murder? Excuse me, nothing would have justified the murders. And in fact, what I saw as a behavioral scientist was a calculated plan by David Koresh to put his plan of action into action, meaning he wasn't a peaceful religious order minding their own business, perhaps collecting some weapons. He went out of his way to attract the attention of law enforcement so that there would have to be some sort of a response in the future. And so we learned through the investigation by ATF agents, for instance, that he had his followers get credit cards and run up the limits so that he knew somebody was going to be investigating that. There were allegations of child abuse, so he knew someone was going to be coming out to the compound to investigate that. Uh, he collected so much arms and ammunition beyond what is necessary for your own self-defense that he knew sooner or later, either ATF, the Sheriff's Department, somebody was going to have to investigate that particular matter. When ATF showed up at that particular day, he had several choices in front of him. He could have surrendered. He could have fired warning shots in the air to stay off of my property. He chose none of those particular events. Instead, he waited for the ATF agents to come up to the compound, and then he ambushed them in order to put his plan into effect. David Koresh, in my mind, as a behavioral scientist, is not a religious martyr. He is a psychopathic criminal, a killer, who used religion in order to exploit people for his own benefit. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kavanaugh? <coughs> Mr. Taylor, there's no reason in America that anyone should shoot on a law enforcement officer serving a warrant. Mr. Sage? I would agree wholeheartedly with what you've heard. I'd also state that uh, I'm very concerned, frankly, of the precedent set by uh, anyone embracing the concept that, uh, that criminals have a right to, uh, to exercise uh, justifiable force, what they feel justifiable force, against uh, officers that are exercising a lawful warrant. That puts all of our society in, in harm's way. I think that observation is, um, adds to the others uh, that during a period of time when the, uh, the defense in many cases is that the defendant becomes the victim and everyone else is forgotten. I think this is a perfect instance of that. Certainly agree with those comments. Uh, as we've heard, uh, Mr. Koresh told 
Robert Rodriguez that he knew ATF was coming, so he was fully aware of who was coming to his front door that day, the way they were equipped, the way they were attired, and to take that kind of action against them is just simply murder, and to, there's no way you can justify that. If you're going to take away from uh, law enforcement the opportunity to survive serving a search warrant issued by a judge, which is absolutely valid on its face, then you're going to condemn law enforcement to being totally incapable of supporting a democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Condi. Mr. Bryant, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I would yield my time to my distinguished colleague from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Uh, the topic of this panel really is negotiations, and I want to go into that issue uh, in a little more depth. Uh, we established earlier that your goal was to get people out without any more deaths. That obviously should have been an important goal. At some point in time, however, a decision was reached that negotiations were not making progress and that you had to do something further, and indeed that led to the gas insertion plan. Mr. Sage, the Department of Justice's own report pretty much lays all that at your feet. It says uh, there was a meeting in Washington on April 14th. The Attorney General, it appears, uh, was resisting the gas insertion plan. Uh, she was frustrated. She asked the question of why now. Uh, and it says both it and an interview I have say that uh, people were di directed to talk with you and that they did talk with you. And this report says that there was a two-hour telephone conversation with Webb, Hubble, and you in which you said Further negotiations with the subjects in the compound would be fruitless, that the only people Koresh had released were older people or people who had given him problems during the time they were in the compound or children whom he had not fathered. It says further that you advised Hubble that Koresh had been disingenuous with his discussions with you about the seven seals. Is all of that accurate? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. And it goes on to say, you were convinced that the FBI had not succeeded in getting anyone released from the compound through negotiations. There were 35 people released, were there not? Ultimately, there was a total of 46, if you, if, if you subscribe to my definition, 35 people that actually came out prior to the 19th. Why would you tell Webb Hubble that you had not succeeded in getting anybody out through negotiations? Because my definition was the quid pro quo, and that's exactly the context in which it was uh, expressed to him. I, we were discussing... So only if they came out as a result of a quid pro quo, was that a success? If I can finish my uh, response to you, Congressman, I'll be happy to. Uh, what I told uh, Mr. Hubble was that from a uh, definition of a, of a negotiated effort, normally a hostage negotiation, in this instance it was not, that we had... Uh, very limited success in a true definition of, of a negotiated release of individuals. I am, I was convinced at that time, I am absolutely convinced now, that the only people that Mr. Koresh let, let out or directed out in hindsight, which we didn't have the privilege of then, were the elderly, the infirmed, those children which were not of his direct line lineage, and troublemakers. I read that. I know you have a right to answer your question. I just have a very limited amount of time. I've I heard that answer. Can I move I on? Apologize. He goes on to say, Hubble recalls Sage saying he believed there was nothing more he or the negotiators could do to persuade Koresh to release anyone else or to come out himself. That's overstated. My comment to him was that uh, we, something to the effect that uh, we had not abandoned negotiations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I personally did not give up hope in negotiations until practically 12.30 on the, uh, the afternoon of the 19th of April. Well, here it says... In a memo from the Justice Department, an interview of uh, Webster Hubble, it says, the Attorney General was told negotiations would, and this is based on the conversation that you had, she was told that negotiations would not get anyone else out of the com compound at the, and that negotiations were at an impasse. Now, all of this is happening on April 14 and April 15. In point of fact, the defense attorneys who were here, whom you can disbelieve if you want, clearly believed themselves that negotiations weren't at an impasse, that in fact the seven seal strategy was a new one and that it might work. My question is, did you advise Webster Hubble of those new negotiations based on the seven seals, of what the attorneys, the defense attorneys believed about them and give him a chance to pass that information on to the attorney general? First of all, the seven seal issue was anything but new. We were hit with the concept of, uh, of explaining the seven seals and they would all come out literally right from the, uh, from the first day. In fact, uh, I believe the evening of the 28th of February. 
Uh, my conversation with Mr. Hubble was that the negotiations were at an impasse as far as the possibility of a substantial number or substantial flow of people out of that compound in the near future, foreseeable future. Uh, I did not then, nor do I now, feel that we were at, uh, at a process where we should abandon negotiations. So you, you did not think that their new renewed sense of enthusiasm on the 14th, as expressed to uh, Mr. Jamar, was valid at all, and, and, and you thought they were just mistaken about that? I think my recollection of this is that the, the emphasis placed on this, this new timetable, which was relayed once again by the attorneys, not by Korish, ever, was, it came after this discussion with Mr. Hubble, in, in my recollection. It did not change anything ultimately because we continued to press for any indication that this was a true, genuine effort and that there was progress being made. There never was. And, and let, me, let me explore that a little further. This was brought forth as a, as a viable, allegedly viable option on the 14th and has been stressed significantly here. On the, we continued to press as to whether or not this was valid through the, the course of negotiations. On the 16th, uh, Judy Schneider, who during the course of, of conversation negotiations expressed that she was the primary typist here, indicated to us that due to the equipment they had inside, that this could take up to a year to complete. She was ba in, in And you gave her more equi different equipment, didn't you? Well, we sent in, first of all, uh, tapes for the, the manual typewriters they had. We stressed that, if, that the concept is fine, but we can, we can provide you with all the equipment you want if you'll just come out. We will facilitate, and in fact, the, the sheriff endorsed that concept. On the, we continued that probe as recently as the evening of the 18th of April, well, the, the evening before the raid. Uh, Steve Schneider admitted to the negotiators that he had not seen the first, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the, the quotes are available to I'm you. I'm going to run out of time, so I can first just page let you of the first seal I have to he ask had not one more seen question. yet. Let me switch topics. I have to ask you one more question. Yes, sir. This is, in fact, not a routine hostage situation. Never uh, was. It, that's been testified to. The point is, you had some people on the inside who, to your knowledge, were not involved in criminal conduct. The children could not have been involved in criminal job conduct. They are incapable of forming criminal intent. So you had people on the inside who were there, but to the best of your knowledge, they were not being held at gunpoint. And indeed, Mrs. Schneider, you just mentioned, one of the purpose of the microphones was to be able to, or the speakers, was for you to be able to broadcast a message back in so that if Koresh wasn't telling them everything in the negotiations, they could hear that. Correct. My concern is, and my question of you is, there came a point in time, sometime over that weekend, and I'd like both you, Mr. Sage, and you, Mr. Jamar, to answer this. There came a point in time where not only had you decided that further negotiations were hopeless and told FBI Washington, and they told the Attorney General Washington, and the decision was made to go with the gas plan. My question is, given that this isn't a normal hostage situation, there are not guns being held at the heads of all of the mothers or all of their children, forcing them to stay in the compound. Wasn't there a duty before you inserted the gas to warn the mothers and the children, middle-aged children, you know, children that were cognizant if they could, that the negotiations had failed on the chance that Koresh hadn't told them and to give them some last chance. You're not dealing with normal hostages who have a gun at their head who can't jump off the airplane. You're dealing with women and children who, if Koresh doesn't tell them that the negotiations have broken down, and you don't tell them that the negotiations have broken down, they have no reason to leave the compound, and yet a point in time comes when you start inserting gas. Was not there an obligation before you push the gas in to allow them? The regular order, he has the right to finish his question. He started it when the yellow light was on. I the same courtesies then because I've been cut off and was not able to answer, get my question answered when the red light went on. Regular order. Wasn't there an obligation as to those innocent children and to women that weren't involved in criminal conduct to at least warn them that negotiations had broken down and maybe not tell them that tear gas was coming in, but tell them that some confrontation was going to occur and if they wanted to run out the back door, they better do it soon. Do I have time to answer that? All the time you need. 
the yeah. answer. Yes, Mr. Sage. You uh, let me just. And Mr. Jamar, too, if you want. Please uh, go ahead. It's kind of a, th a three question question. Uh, first, whether or not uh, there was any expression that, that we were at a, a total impasse and that further negotiation was hopeless, I believe was a term that you used, and I've seen that referred to in the, in the report. Here. That's correct. As I mentioned before, I think that's an overstatement. It may well have been the concept or the, the recollection of Mr. Hubble, I can't speak for him, but I can speak for myself. I never abandoned the concept or the hope that negotiations could successfully and peacefully resolve this matter. My statement to him at the time, and there were several people privy to this conversation, both in Washington, D.C. and uh, in Waco, was that I felt that we were, were at an impasse, that we had not gotten uh, a, ch a single child out, which uh, again was our first uh, priority since the 5th of March. The 5th of March. This is the 15th of April. Uh, not that it was completely over, but it realistic assessment of it was that we had obviously reached a very significant point that we needed to uh, to factor into further consideration and this was a consensus of the negotiation team not just me mr hubble wanted to talk to uh, a member of the negotiation team and i was selected to uh, participate in that conversation and was more than willing to do so number two as far as the release of those children we specifically from the first day and it's been uh, elaborated upon quite efficiently by uh, Mr. Cavanaugh and I think by the rest of the panel. That was our primary focus. The last child came out the 5th of March. We continued to press. There was one point in time when David Corr said to the negotiator uh, that the rest of these kids are different. And we said, wait a minute, David, you said that all those kids were your kids and they were precious and so forth. And this is again is paraphrasing, but we can get you the exact quote or if it's already available to you. He later said, very specifically and candidly, because I remember it, because I, I will never forget it, it raised the hackles on the back of my neck. He said, basically, these are my biological children. And he said it in such a fashion that it was very clear, if not articulated, that they were not coming out. That was the 7th of March. We continued to pursue every viable option to try to get not only just those children, but everyone out of the compound. The last aspect of it, was a notification. It's a very valid question. There was continuing notification, continuing opportunity for them to come out for 51 days. We talked during the course of this matter uh, a total of 949 conversations during the course of the negotiations. 949. Total of 214 hours, almost 215. And we talked to a total of 68 people, including mothers and children. Every single person that we talked to, we asked them at least two core questions. Are you there voluntarily? And can you please make arrangements to come out? Every single one of them said they did not want to exit that compound. That has to be a part of this record. We tried to get them out constantly for 51 days, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We were available to facilitate that. As far as formal notice, when ultimately the decision was made, to go in the morning of the 19th of April to exercise what we felt was the lowest potential threshold of, of threat to those people, and that's the introduction of, of a non-lethal tear gas. I was the one that put the telephone call into the compound at 5.59 in the morning. That was one of the toughest calls I ever made. At the same time that I was on the phone, I had a microphone clipped to my uh, vest informing everybody over that PA system that we were in the process of delivering a non-lethal tear gas into the compound. We were not entering the compound. That's why we referred to it as not being an assault. We've taken a lot of lumps on that comment. The reason I said that is we had no intention, nor did we ever, enter that compound in an armed fashion. That was a formal notice to every mother, every child, every parent, anybody that had a common shred of decency. I'm telling you, I've been through CS gas a number of times and I would move heaven and earth to get my children out of that type of an environment. That's why it was introduced, Congressman, to initiate an environment which would cause those people to come out safely, not even orderly. At the end, uh, before the fire and certainly after the fire, we begged them, I begged them, to come out through any exit they could and to follow the instructions of the agents waiting to provide them with medical assistance and take them into custody. Thank you, Mr. Jamar. Chairman. Your response to the 
Mr. Vaughn. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think the duty also includes that we don't sit still and let their children die of disease. We don't sit still and let their children continue to be abused. We don't sit still and let Corish pick the time to leave the compound at 1 o'clock in the morning with a horde of people with a child under one arm and a machine gun under the other. I think that duty extends to ensuring that we do everything in our power to get those people out, but also at the same time make the area safe for them. So that's why we cleared this stuff out, to make it harder for Corish to do a breakout. One of the things all of us were concerned the first day was a breakout, where it's, you know, suicide by cop is, a, is a one way of putting it. It was something we feared absolutely. And when we learned of the, um, of the suicide pack, which we didn't learn for several weeks, and we, uh, it wasn't corroborated until well afterward, but it was a fear that that duty extended to doing everything physically and emotionally and mentally and, and through any speech or anything else we could do, that duty extended in everything we brought to that place. And that duty, we, I think, we exercised, I think, in the, in the best way we could do it. And the failure was our failure, no question about that. But that failure was made certain by David Korsh. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Condit, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jamar, Mr. Sage, and the rest of the panel, I I'd like to focus just a little bit during this whole episode the, uh, the news media, uh, the news networks reported prophecy uh, by Mr. Koresh and uh, terms like all the saints will die uh, through explosion, blood and fire. These were prophecies that he had been making. My uh, questions to you and, and is, did you ever consider his prophecy as a possibility that there would be a mass suicide by fire. I mean, to me, it seems that, that you had to take that serious. And did you make preparations for that, uh, that there would be a fire? Uh, what, what was your planning process for that? I mean, my understanding is that you had to call the Waco Fire Department to help you, you put out the fires. And I'm wondering, did you anticipate there might be some substance some truth to the prophecy? Did you take that serious, and did you plan for it? Let me answer the suicide portion uh, first, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Jamar. Uh, one of the toughest things as a negotiator, I've been a negotiator for 18 years in the FBI, uh, is the issue of addressing an individual, and, and you can well imagine it, that may be potentially suicidal with that very topic. But the uh, mental health professionals will tell you that that is precisely the manner in which that should be done, and that's exactly what we did repeatedly. Uh, and that can be brought to your attention in the form of, uh, of the negotiation tapes. We address both with, with Schneider, with, uh, directly with Korish, with Wayne Martin, with a number of the individuals, but particularly those in leadership roles, the possibility, as bluntly as do you intend to commit suicide. The responses were, uh, were overwhelmingly uh, that they did not. Uh, Korsh on, on occasion said he was too young to die in there. Uh, uh, Schneider uh, mentioned specifically that that was against their religion. It was a sin, an unpardonable sin, I believe he mentioned. But we continued to address it. We also uh, framed questions with the assistance of the behavioral science people to try to determine uh, or elicit from them uh, answers that they might not realize would, would lend itself to a, a very probative uh, analysis of, of what their true mindset was. Were their responses terminal, indicating the possibility of suicide, or were they long-term in nature, indicating the, the possibility of, of survival? In almost every single instance, their response to specific questions and subtle questions were survival-oriented. Uh, we felt very confident, probably too confident, uh, that these people did not intend uh, to exercise an option of a mass suicide. And we move forward with, with efforts along those lines. I'll turn it over to Mr. Jamar. Mr. Condit, to answer your question on the, the planning for the possibility of fire, um, part of our operations plan, uh, which was very comprehensive, I think you have access to a copy of it, part of it was local emergency medical service and, and uh, to include local ambulances that we could bring in to help us. We, we brought in a lot of our own helicopters and everything else. But part of the, the concern was fire suppression. The number one fire department was Bell Mead, actually, not, not Waco. Okay. 
We had Bellmead Fire Department, uh, the primary responder, which um, we um, had a response time, a minimum of um, one unit in eight minutes, two units in 12 minutes. Uh, Waco Fire Department, there's a description of the several units here, a response time of minimum of two pumper trucks within 10 minutes. That's, we had that access to us right there. We didn't have fire trucks at the, at the site because we viewed fire as a possibility. And when you, when you, the, the references you cite, theological and others, there were direct references, but not as many as portrayed by witnesses, I think, in the past here. I think um, it was a possibility, hardly a probability. There's a lot of reasons not to bring the fire trucks. One is operational security, but the other is, is what occurred, is when the fire, fire did start and the fire trucks did arrive, I didn't let them in. I held them at the crack point because I didn't want the firemen to drive into gunfire. I just wasn't going to permit it. I mean, it, it was a, it's a terrible thing, a very terrible decision to have to make. But I, I, didn't, I didn't hesitate. It, wasn't that, it, was, it took me that two seconds to make it. But it, we held the fire trucks. So that was our fire planning. Let me ask Mr. you. Mr. Condit, uh, could I add to that? Yes, sir. That, that, Absolutely. Uh, day in, day out, David Koresh preached an apocalyptic uh, theology. So fire and brimstone was a regular part of his of his dialogue. So it's hard to discern, is this his general theological approach to the ending of the world, or is he specifically talking about a fire? And uh, while we never trusted it one way or the other, the remedy we chose to deal with it, as Mr. Sage suggested, we confronted them with the time and again what their intentions were. And at no time did he specifically say, we're going to start this place on fire. I understand that. W was there any concern or consideration given to using a suppressant like Avalon or something, have, making that available? You, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, it, it's a fire suppressant. How do you deliver it? I, well, they have a way of doing it in other places on ships and, and things, but apparently you did not, that was not a consideration. That you no, wait, but the, the, problem, the, the, the problem is the same with any delivery system, is the same as the fireman. I think. Yeah, you just couldn't bring it in because right. of the safety of the fire yeah, trucks. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm, whatever little time I have left, I'd like to yield to my colleague from California, uh, Ms. Lofton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Conant. I think you, know, you were dealing with, by the time you got there, a well-armed, barricaded, maniacal, messianic, well-armed child molester and as the, uh, with, who was controlling a bunch of people within the compound. And uh, what you faced was very difficult. And I think uh, you did it uh, your best, I, I am convinced, to save uh, children and uh, in a decent way. I'm interested, and I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but I've asked a number of other people and no one seems to know the answer. I think key to dealing with a cult of this nature is, to, is early intervention um, before things get so out of hand. And one of the incidents that I'm very interested in, why nothing happened, and maybe you can tell me, or did something fall through the cracks, or, or why this would happen. In the summer of 1990, when the cult was in Laverne, California, the po Laverne police were called when the uh, son of a cult member, Robin Bunn, was kidnapped by a Koresh follower to Texas. And the police, and this is well documented in our material, the police gave Koresh 48 hours to return this little boy, who was then returned. However, at the same time, uh, the uh, Ms. Bunt, who was, had left the cult, told the police, and they were able to verify it, that they, Koresh had been uh, uh, taking very young girls below the age of consent as his wives, one of whom was a 14-year-old girl from Australia. I don't, it did not appear from the record that she had an adequate visa. When they returned, uh, Koresh had taken this 14-year-old girl as his wife to Texas. And I wondered throughout, how come, I mean, that is transporting a child across state lines to have sex with her, I mean, that's a problem. Why wasn't, why didn't something happen then before this cult grew and things got out of hand? Why didn't the FBI go after him for child molesting? Why didn't the Laverne, or maybe they did. Can, does anybody know the answer to that? Well, I think the, the answer that you described, um, I'm not sure the FBI would, would have been made aware of it. Uh, I don't think um, the statute you cite um, is utilized um, 
except instances where there is um, a kidnapping or um, uh, there was a complaint, family complaints. I think this was a family agreed to let their daughter marry this person, to, to marry Korish. If you're talking about Rachel, I presume that's who you're talking about, his wife, Rachel. Um, those type of incidents, I think, um, where young girls are taken into prostitution even, they, among the priorities and in investigations and prosecutions and federal courts, isolated <laughs> cases of um, non-kidnapping, non-heavily um, um, abused children being taken for prostitution don't really make it up to the, to the top of the surface, uh, sadly. Uh, I think when you, when you go home the night you drive out and you drive in certain parts of this city or any major city in the United States, you can see children on the street for various reasons. I think it's, um, you're talking about intervention. Um, the intervention's 10 years too late. Um, it's sad, and I think this is just one more instance of, of children and uh, young people just falling through the cracks of society. So maybe we'd be better off putting some more resources there early on rather than later in a lot of instances. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Condes' time has expired. I now recognize for five minutes Mr. Ehrlich. And I will be glad to yield my time to my friend and colleague, Mr. Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Ehrlich. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for appearing today. Uh, as a former United States Attorney, I certainly want to recognize uh, all federal law enforcement and make it clear that, that this entire panel does not mean these hearings as a blanket indictment against federal law enforcement officials, that we have a great deal of respect uh, for all of you. Uh, however, it is our duty as a Congress to have oversight over uh, the FBI and the ATF. And certainly, it is our job the Monday morning quarterback in certain instances, realizing we weren't out there having to make the decisions at that point. With that edit editorializing over, I wanted to ask Mr. Smerick, uh, you had commented earlier that uh, in regards to your fifth report, you'd given four reports, in essence cautioning a conservative approach to this. The fifth approach apparently was uh, a change in, in policy in terms of uh, a more con a, a confrontational approach. You said you did that maybe subliminally, whatever, but you felt pressure. Who was the gentleman that asked you or made this comment to you about this? Did you say John Douglas? John Douglas. Uh, and who is he? The chief uh, of the uh, investigative support unit of the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. He is the, the chief, and he is your direct supervisor, your boss. He was at the time. He has since retired. Okay. And did he say that the attorney general was not happy with the flow, the Tone, ten, tenor and tone of your no, report. No, sir, nothing like that at all. He just indicated that he felt that um, superiors at FBI HQ felt that by recommending as much caution as I was, we were tying the hands of the FBI from taking any type of action. I'm not talking in terms of using CS gas or attacking the compound or anything like that. As we've discussed earlier, there's a difference in philosophy regarding tactics that can be used in a situation like this. And so where I might be in a side in this particular situation of the negotiators and say, talk, 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 perhaps the tactical side or the commanders may feel we need a little bit more pressure, a little bit more stress on the situation, such as shutting off the electricity. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's a degree of difference okay. here. I, I may have misunderstood you, but I, I thought in your first testimony you did mention specifically that the Attorney General was unhappy. No, sir, and, not the and Attorney I know the General. Will show it that. was Director Sessions. Uh, Director Sessions was not happy with that's that. That's what John Douglas uh, reported to me, yes. Okay. Now, Mr. J. Moore, let me ask you again uh, to name names for me as I want to ask the, the, the questions. In the context of you being the field supervisor at Waco mm -hmm. in charge of what was going on, yes, sir. and Washington, which way, who made the decision uh, to use CS gas? Was it that came from Washington? Or was it at your recommendation? And without a great deal of deep, uh, reasoning why, but you know, what's the flow okay, the, on that? The, the operations plan we submitted March 27th uh, was the, the plan that was, with modifications became the April 19th. However, we did an emergency plan the first week we were there in case we detected something like, let's, go, let's kill five children and show them we mean business, or let's start doing it. There's, there's a lot going on inside there. 
one of the few options we have, non-lethal, to try to stop some kind of conduct like that is gas. So, so that, but the, the gas that was recommended to us from the start, and the gas we the FBI has used, and I, Los Angeles Police Department has used, and I think, I don't know what law enforcement doesn't use CS gas, that uh, that was just that. With okay, the, but the decision to, to use well, gas at Waco was a decision that it's was It's part of our plan. operations plan that I recommended. And that went up to Washington? Yes, sir. And then they approved it and the approval came down? Correct. Okay. Now, the same question in terms of the, that particular day, uh, because I'm still intrigued as to the what reason caused, compelled you, actually compelled you to go on April the 19th. Uh, what reason was there, and again, what was the flow up or down on that decision to go on that particular day? Okay. The, let's, let's go forward to where the operations plan by the FBI is, we're all in agreement now. That took several days. And where it's presented to the Attorney General. The Attorney General is considering this plan. The conditions and circumstances which led to the recommendation, which would have been, been late March, had not changed. Nothing had changed during that period of time that made us recommend it. We didn't sit still. Was, you've heard what we did during that period of time to include all the negotiations and the lawyers and everything else. But the circumstances remained the same. And the, and the, the, highlight, the, the motivating factor to me during that time was the danger that I tried to describe earlier. The danger to the, the increasing danger overall to everyone in the place. That that's the, the, as time passed, the possibility of a breakout increased every day. And there were plenty of other dangers too. But the, those circumstances were the same. Okay? When I was notified in the evening of the 17th that the plan had been approved by the Attorney General, the first thing I did was check the weather because we had spent 51 days there in rain and th Texas thunderstorms that were horrendous. And the weather was good. And that, that the weather was a, probably the primary factor for me was that the, it was a clear, it was going to be clear and that, uh, as, uh, but nothing had changed. Not one thing had changed since that period, could I, during could that period I, could of time. Could I interrupt you real quickly? Sure. And I think maybe Mr., uh, uh, I don't have your name, this. Sage. Mr. Sage, you answered this. Uh, was there any obligation, and maybe you did this, on your part to give the compound warning right before this raid occurred that there is going to be gas injected and if the children are going to leave, you better leave in the next 15 minutes. Did you do that or was there any obligation to do that? It was my, uh, my instruction in the evening before uh, we had prepared a specific uh, list uh, of issues that I was to present to the compound, both over the phone, if we had that option, and at simultaneously over the, um, over the PA system. That, in fact, was done. It started, I called in at 5.59. Steve Schneider was on the phone shortly thereafter. I just began to get into that uh, particular issue, whereupon he hung up. The microphones uh, indicate two things. They immediately donned gas masks, and they immediately began to spread fuel. Uh, I continued with the broadcast then for the rest of the morning uh, and for six solid hours, advising them that we were in the process of delivering gas. My understanding is, is nearly 10 minutes passed that the first CEV was in the uh, process of, of approaching the compound. They had plenty of time to have uh, to have at least started. All they needed to do, uh, and this was my understanding all along, all they needed to do was send us some sort of a signal, any kind of signal, that they were prepared to begin a safe and orderly evacuation. The whole thing would have come to, to all stop, and we would have facilitated them coming out. Mr. Bryant, your time is, is up. We are at the point now where we have uh, four or five votes in a row, gentlemen, on the floor. There are five-minute votes, so we should be back here fairly shortly to complete your testimony. Uh, I will now have this committee in recess until the five minutes after the last of this series of votes. Committees are in recess. The Joint House Subcommittee hearing on the Waco investigation will continue in just a moment. First, some program information. 
This weekend, we begin our live coverage of the National Governors Association Summer Meeting in Burlington, Vermont. Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, C-SPAN brings you the opening news conference with Governors Howard Dean of Vermont and Tommy Thompson of Wisconsin, NGA Chairman and Vice Chairman. Sunday night, the latest developments on the road to the White House. Campaign events, speeches, debates, and forums. This week, Colin Powell and Campaign 96. Segments from previous interviews with the former Joint Chiefs Chairman and a look at what role, if any, he'll play in the upcoming presidential race. Road to the White House, Sunday at 7 and 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time on C-SPAN, the political network of record. Sunday on C-SPAN, with the British House of Commons in recess, we take a look at the people and politics of the United Kingdom. This weekend, British Ambassador to the U.S. Robin Rennick on the eve of his retirement. We think that if the United Nations didn't exist, we'd have to invent it, because it, when, it, when it comes to crises like in Rwanda or Burundi, or indeed in Somalia, you have to get somebody uh, to try to help deal with these crises. They have been successful in Cambodia. They were successful in Namibia. Their failures get very heavily advertised, but we do believe that they fulfill an essential role. People and Politics of the United Kingdom, Sunday night at 9 Eastern and Pacific Time. We now return to Wednesday's proceedings examining the Waco investigation. Last week, a House Joint Subcommittee began hearings into events at Waco, Texas in the spring of 1993. Joint, the Joint Subcommittee is on the Waco hearing matter and will come to order. When we recessed a few minutes ago, we were at the point where it was Mr. Brewster's opportunity to question, and I will recognize you for five minutes, Mr. Brewster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chamor, I know that uh, you didn't create the incident in Waco, that your group was called in to try to bring some resolution to it at a later time. Uh, several questions along with that. When was the plan set up and uh, the date of April 19th set as termination point? The plan was submitted uh, first in late March, uh, given to the Attorney General after a re discussion within the FBI. She approved the plan uh, uh, April 17th. The plan of the 19th being the termination the plan that was, I'm sorry, the plan that was, that was uh, um, performed on the 19th she approved the 17th, yes. Okay, the plan to execute on the 19th was approved on the 17th. Yes. So really the negotiations didn't play a lot of uh, part in the last couple of days then, is that correct? Oh, well, they played a great part. I think the had, um, of course, had a different attitude. Had we had any, any signal of a change, we wouldn't have gone on the 19th. I read the, the transcript. Uh, and he says several times in there that he wants to come out, wants to have a shower, wants to do those things. But once again, I guess most of those things had been said before. Is that correct? Almost every day. So that was really nothing new. No, sir. Uh, he also mentions in here that he was uh, getting awful tired of eating the MREs. I've heard that's in the military before. Mm -hmm. uh, how much more food did they have in there? Do you have any idea? I think the estimate was, when observed, uh, was at least two more years. They were eating about 6,000 meals a month. So that would be, uh, my goodness, and they had two or 300,000 of the MREs? Well, they weren't all MREs. I think they had, I think a figure I saw was 50,000 MREs they had purchased. 50,000 MREs. Right? A ton of potatoes. They had all kind of cans of, you know, of, um, vegetables and fruits. Along that same line, uh, I know some of the people uh, were suggesting, uh, Mr. Schmerick, I think at one point, suggested that uh, maybe pressure wasn't the right thing, 
that uh, these people could be suicidal. I think back in early March, like the 8th, 9th, 10th, somewhere along there, you had a, several of those. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you had to make a decision on what you thought was the best outcome mm -hmm. and didn't choose to go that way. But in looking at the way pressure was applied, and, and I heard rumors that can't be true, surely, did you in fact play tapes of rabbits being slaughtered? I think among the sounds and everything that was played, and again, that, that began March 22nd, not back when the first week in March, March 22nd. I think among that was um, all sorts of sounds. Uh, I think the uh, rabbits, one of the things that the media reported. Yes. And they, for what length of time? I think probably, I don't know how, how there was such a mix, it probably wasn't done very often. There was a, there was a, a person in Houston that provided us um, this library of tapes and sounds designed for this sort of thing. And there were all sorts of sounds. Well, as one who's a varmint hunter, a, a predator call is about the eeriest thing I've ever heard. And I was uh, kind of curious if, mm -hmm. if that was really true, if it was. Tell me, what would have been lost by waiting another 10, 20, or 60 days uh, to do the execution of the final scene? Well, I think the, the thing that, that I hope I can get across, the uh, most important in that regard, is that and when once we decided that uh, we would recommend that we do a the plan that became the plan on the April 19th, that um, the fear we had all along was a breakout. And the thing is, as, as time passed, it was going to get to the point where, by his actual 19th, I think, removes any doubt in my mind about this, that he would decide when it would happen. And how would we stop him? What we could we do to stop him from doing either a mass suicide inside um, by poison, whatever you want to do, shooting people, a fire, a breakout with a child, whatever that might have been, he would dictate when that occurred. And how would we stop him? What could we do not only without gunning everybody down or, or entering the place and killing a bunch of people to stop him? Well, it's gas, CS gas. So what we wanted to do was do it on our schedule as best we can. Now, we wouldn't have done it at all with any inkling of any change. But we want to do it on our schedule. We don't want him doing it at 1 o'clock in the morning. We're not prepared. So it, as time passed, the possibility of that with him making sure that his prophecy came true was, was going to be more and more possible to occur. And so if, the longer we waited, the more apt that was to occur. So you waited 51 days, and had you waited another 20 or 60 days, uh, you think in your mind there's a good possibility he would have tried to break out? So to well, no, the possibility was there. I'm, I'm, my, my point to you is that the ending was going to be the same. He was going to have that ending no matter what. Now, could we have gotten a few more people out if they became ill or he wanted to expel them or to negotiate them out? That's a possibility. I don't think there's any question about that. But the end, he was going to have that end in one manner or another. I'm firmly, I'm firmly uh, believe that. In yesterday's testimony, we had uh, a group that I personally think, having lived in Texas a number of years, is one of the more professional groups I know, the Texas Rangers. Mm -hmm. They were very unhappy with the treatment they received from the FBI down there. I think for me, it sounded like more than just. The, I think the bureaus of. I think it sounded like I'm the one that they correctly had complaints about. Did you realize that at the time? No, or? I did not. I, I think uh, it's. Uh, but I think I heard that, that uh, they were concerned about a, what they had to wait for me. I think it was during the first week. And uh, sometimes never got to meet with you at all. Well, I think um, um, probably that first week, we were so run around all over the place and everything, I think that we got off on the wrong foot. When I learned that, when I discovered, because I thought we had agents over there all the time, I thought it was okay. When I learned that, I went to see Captain Burns, and I apologized and tried to, rebuild it. But the problem was, and, 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 and it's an absolute legitimate complaint on their part, here they were asked to come into a federal matter, one of the biggest disasters in law enforcement history, and investigate the homicide. And they run into me, and I'm constantly undermining their case. Mm -hmm. Won't now, let them check the footprints? Won't well, no, I, that's not true. Cars. That's not so. Not that's let not them so? check the footprints. No, I think it was circumstances that kept that, the rain and the, what was going on with the compound. I never did that. I never said they can't do that. I think they just misunderstood why they, we didn't get them out there when they wanted to go. But what they're complaining about 
me just, just taking the evidence away and letting the lawyers go in, absolutely legitimate complaint on their part. It's terribly frustrating for them. Terribly frustrating for the prosecutors. They weren't real happy about it either. One other question. Your time, unfortunately, has expired. I I'll let you go a little while here, but I can't have to put you in check. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hyde, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm pleased to yield my five minutes to you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Hyde, for yielding. Mr. Jamar, I want to follow up on a couple of questions, one of them being the sanitation question inside the compound during the time of the siege and leading up to the April 19th date. You've indicated that it was less than what you would find on the outside. I assume you're referring to things such as the fact that I don't believe they had any toilets in there and that sort of thing. Could you tell me what these sanitary condition problems were as you perceived them, what the conditions were inside in general terms, and what might have been different about that from perhaps what was the case before the siege began? Okay, well, the, before, let's start with the, with the conditions we understood before the siege. That women and children were allowed to use um, uh, toss pots. Men were allowed to go out into uh, it would be the equivalent of an outhouse. So that was in the uh, whatever accumulated during the day would be tossed out at the end of the day. There was one spigot of water in the entire building. They had water tanks. Um, would be the lower right side behind that you can't see them there, but right behind. See where the fence comes out and loops. Well, they're inside the compound. The white plastic, large. They had. Water tanks that were that that so they had a well, an electric well, 600 foot deep well, and there was one spigot from those water tanks, drip spigot, into the place. That's it. That's all the plumbing they had operating. So when when they had this when the siege began, they couldn't get rid of all that as they used to. There was a huge sewage field out to the right, what we call the red side. That was about 30 yards out, or maybe not far, maybe 60 feet. To, out the sewage field. I mean, that the, when the agents put the concertina wire, they were knee deep in sewage. They were dumping it out there, and then behind the place was a sewage field. So they couldn't go out there and dump it. Uh, well, while the we, siege was they on. dumped it anyway, but we ended up dumping it all into the side. It would be to the left with that under, like, was it covered by a tar paper? It looked like there. Yes, sir. That was filled with human waste. Um, when on April 19th, when the agents went in, which you'll hear so, about later. So that is the the difference in the conditions. They were not able to go out as far away as they were to dump it, but they, the conditions as far as not having running water or plumbing were that way for a year or more before this happened. Yes, sir. And the other thing we did, we asked for a tape of the children, so we had forced them to clean the children, because we knew they wouldn't send a tape out with dirty children. It was a way of us finding about their water, but they had plenty of water. But the, um, we thought they had a water shortage, because when, when Branch and Whitecliffe came out, they were, they were dehydrated. But that was a disciplinary by, uh, action by Horish. So it really wasn't a water shortage. The point no. is that the only difference in the conditions, though they were certainly far from ideal, uh, bef as before the siege, during the siege, and, and at the end of it, was this question of where they dumped the sewage and how close it was in its ultimate accumulation. I presume you assume that would ultimately become a problem, though, at any given time. Well, it I wasn't was. sure when and it there would were be dead a bodies in there, too. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, but but so there. far as we know, no disease had occurred as a result of that, no illnesses particularly that we were able to detect. Is that what you were able to detect? Is we were correct? frightened after the TB. It was, and we had everybody who was there inoculated for TB. But, but, there was but no, you didn't no, have it, no, no manifestation of it at the time? No, sir. It was a fear of it. Okay. Now, I want to get back to this question, Mr. Sage, of your conversation with Mr. Hubble that you were responding to Mr. Shattig about concerning the issue of what you may have told him on the... Uh, I guess it was the 15th of April during that two-hour telephone conversation regarding the Daguerrean uh, breakthrough issue. Now, let, let me frame it a minute, the question I want to ask you. And, and I'd like maybe Mr. Jamar to, uh, to respond in the generic, too, so I'll ask you to listen up to this. From yesterday's testimony, both by Daguerrean, Zimmerman, and as well Mr. Tabor and perhaps Mr. Dr. Arnold, it's my uh, impression that they believe that at the by the 14th or the 15th of April, I guess it was the 14th, there was a difference in Koresh's attitude, uh, that he had looked at things differently, that he wasn't now looking at becoming a martyr. They believed, and I think they were sincere in this belief, that at that point he had switched, and they had been able to convince him to switch his thinking to the fact that instead of God wanting him to be the martyr in the Messiah uh, idea of, of coming out, 
that he was going to be the messenger under his interpretation of the seals in the, in the book of Revelations. And that by writing these instruments, uh, that he was interpreting the seals, by putting them down and writing them, that he'd be able to come out and publish them, even though he might be in jail. Uh, he would be able to produce these things in some way, and he would be able to fulfill that particular uh, mission as opposed to the martyrdom. Now, they seem very genuine in that conclusion. And that was, I assume I'm correct, the basis of what was, quote, new, unquote, on the 14th of April uh, about this. The seals themselves, the fact he wanted to interpret the seals wasn't new, but his change, their perception of his change of attitude, at least they were conveying that to you. Am I correct in that? Is that the way you read I, it? I think they absolutely believed that. I think they were as deceived on the 15th of April with, uh, or yes, with 15th of April by Korish in this particular venture as we were as I was on the, uh, yes, the sir, 2nd of March. My point is, just for the record, it, that was your impression, and I've got that down as well as theirs, that that's what the Daguerrean was looking at, that's what he was thinking, and that's what, what his impression was, and yours was, of what, now whether you thought they were deceived or not, that's another story. My question is, this new idea of Daguerrean, deceived or otherwise, uh, was that, that new development, if you will, that Daguerrean thought he had obtained uh, Koresh's state of mind being different, and the seals being, I mean, the, uh, uh, the interpretations being written down, and, and this change from desire to be martyr, a martyr. Was this aspect of Daguerrean's interpretation, um, and Tabor's interpretation of it, was that conveyed by you in that telephone conversation, Mr. Hubble? It seemed to me that you were saying that you thought perhaps that the discussions with Daguerrean took place after the Hubble conversation. And if it was not conveyed during the Hubble conversation on the 15th of April, did you ever convey that, or did Mr. Jamar ever convey this to Mr. Hubble, or personally, as opposed to up the chain of command through written form or whatever, to anybody in Washington uh, in the Justice Department, or to Mr. Hubble, or anybody in the White House, right. before, uh, before the 19th? My recollection is that uh, we gave, I gave a uh, very general overview as to the uh, dynamics of negotiations since the first day, since I was the only one there that had been there the entire time. Uh, I gave them direct, candid insight uh, as to what my observations were as to the success uh, and to date and or failure of negotiated efforts. Uh, and as straightforward a consensus from the negotiation team as to what the possibility was of a successful resolution. I would like to mention this. I was, I was surprised that, uh, that I was to talk to Mr. Hubble. Uh, I was, when I responded to uh, Waco from the very beginning, it was not in the form of, of being a, uh, in a supervisory role or anything else. It was to be a negotiator in the trench. Uh, and that's exactly where I was the entire time. I, in hindsight, consider it to, uh, to have been very um, commendable uh, for them to have sought out not only the uh, opinion of the, uh, let's say, on-scene commander or the, the command level personnel, but also the, the specific frank insights of those individuals that were there in the trenches where it was going on to ensure that they were getting an accurate representation of the dynamics of what was going on. That's exactly what I attempted to do. But the question you haven't answered is, and I just want the answer to my question, is did you convey this new thing from Daguerrean explicitly to Hubble or on another occasion to anyone else in the Justice Department or in the White House, you personally, uh, by telephone or in person, uh, between the time you got that uh, that information on the 14th of April or on or about that date and the date of the, uh, the ultimate assault? The, 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 answer to, the answer to that, the best of my recollection, is that on the 15th of April, this, first of all, was not a new revelation to us as, as far as the seven seals. I've mentioned that previously. I know, but, but the but other aspect was. I Mr. Believe. Chairman, Go ahead. I think I can clarify. Well, you can, but let Mr. Sage finish first, please. We were, we were still in the process of trying to determine through negotiation process the, the veracity of the offer that had been laid forward. I do not, to, to specifically answer your question, I do not remember uh, addressing in any detail 
the dynamics of that because it hadn't unfolded yet. It had not unfolded yet. We didn't know the veracity of his offer, whether or not he had followed through. Ultimately, he did not. So your answer is you personally did not convey it explicitly? Not it that I recall on the 15th or any time thereafter. Mr. Jamar? Mr. Chairman, uh, previously I, I, did not, I, was not uncert I was not certain whether it had been conveyed to the Attorney General. I've since been told that she was made aware of it. And among other things, it's the reason that she asked Mr. Hubble to call out and talk to a negotiator is because where does this, what does this mean to the negotiations? And to satisfy her before she made the decision, she asked Mr. Hubble to call an, a, a negotiator. When they called out that said that, that there was someone from the Attorney General's office wanted to talk to a negotiator, I selected Mr. Uh, Sage because he'd been there from the very beginning. But he the, had the best but, feel. But Mr. Jamar, the question was not whether you had been told the Attorney General knew about it. We'll find that out down the road and confirm it or deny it. Question is, did you yourself or do you know of anybody in your team who personally talked and told Mr. Hubble of this new information explicitly or anybody else in Washington in the Attorney General's office, Justice Department in other words, or the White House uh, after that information on the 14th came into being well, my before, the, before the assault? I'm sorry. The, my previous testimony was that, that I presumed that it had been done. I could not cite how and who. But you did not personally do No, it. sir. No, sir. All right. That's all I wanted to know. You okay. don't know how or who. Thank but you it, very but much. But it was accomplished. Mr. Lantos. Chairman. We have been inundated in the last uh, few days with uh, countless detailed questions and detailed answers. What I'd like to do with you gentlemen is to ask you to sit back, take a deep breath, and look at the broad picture. There have been basically three kinds of approaches to this tragedy. One approach, this is the approach of what I call the lunatic fringe, still clings to the notion that there was a gigantic governmental conspiracy that brought about this nightmare. It is difficult to see how any rational human being subscribe to, subscribe to such a notion, but obviously many do. The second broad area where most are relates to the kind and nature and level of mistakes made by various governmental authorities uh, along the way. And I suspect uh, we can debate ad nauseum and ad infinitum the specifics of the mistakes. And that is not my intention. But the third arena in approaching this tragedy is the one that I think has received the least attention so far, which to me is intriguing because in many ways I think the answer is to be found in the third arena. The only analogy we have to this episode in American history, certainly in recent American history, is the tragedy in Jonestown, Guyana, where you had a charismatic criminal who had an apocalyptic vision and who brought about the death under the most nightmarish circumstances of about 900 American citizens. There was no FBI, there was no ATF, there was no Justice Department. None of the conspiracy theories could work. There was really no question about mistakes being made by our law enforcement agencies because they were basically not there. Yet, 900 American citizens under the spell of a criminally insane, charismatic cult leader lost their lives. They were either killed or they committed suicide, or they were forced to commit suicide. But I would like to ask each of you, and each of you is an expert because you've been dealing with this issue, is not to worry about the details now. We have spent plenty of time on that, perhaps more than this committee should have. But I want you to look at the broad picture, and beginning you, with you, Mr. Jamar, I want you to tell me whether you see any analogy 
between the Jonestown nightmare, whether this at any time during this process crossed through your mind, consciously, subconsciously, as you think back at this whole horrible episode in your life, do you feel that you may have been influenced by what you remember happened at Jonestown? I was asked the question was in a media briefing April 20th, 1993, was this another Jonestown? And I, my answer was, it is, if you look at it as a charismatic leader causing the death of all of his followers. Our fear all along was that Korish would find a way to make those people die in his name and his glory, and he would survive. And that was my greatest fear, not that, that it makes a difference whether he died or not. It's just that that was his, he was so... Uh, concerned about himself, that uh, one of the one of the descriptions of him as a psychopathic personality is that he's not really interested in dying for any cause, including his own, uh, even so to fulfill reject, a prophecy. If I may interrupt you, yes. so you reject the notion that one of my colleagues uh, uh, introduced yesterday and had a dialogue with the defense attorneys that if rational people had just waited ten days, everything would have been all right. Well, I think that as I said earlier, that he was going to find this end. Those people are going to die in his name and with him or without him. Right. One way or another, whether 10 days, a year later, where it was, I'm convinced of that ending. Uh, still, I would have waited a year if we had something to work with, if there was just something there we could attach something to. We did it for, from March 1st when, or February 28th until the decision was made in the, in the late March that we thought we were going nowhere. And we were afraid he was going to dictate when the people, or when, his, when he was going to cause it. And we couldn't prevent it as easy as we could have otherwise. Um, that's a long time. We did a lot. And we did more even after that. But I am convinced that he was going to end it his way. He controlled events from the February 28th. He controlled events with us March 2nd. And there's not, I don't think there's an event that he didn't control other than the weather, maybe. So you see an analogy with Jonestown? Uh, yes, sir. Could I ask the rest of you gentlemen to respond? During the negotiation process, we mentioned Jonestown many times. It was on our minds, and we were certainly aware of this might be a, a precedent for Mr. Koresh. I think it's imp important that this committee examines uh, what we did in law enforcement and to determine how we can improve in the future. And I, I, for one, didn't agree with every decision out there. And, and, and we've learned from that. And we've taken sure. corrective actions in the FBI. But there's one thing I have to tell you, as having spent so much of my career in the field of negotiations, there are no guarantees. I could talk to 38 people wanting to commit suicide today, and we could probably convince 36, 37 of them not to do it. But the other handful of them will do it, no, regardless of what we do. And that's because of what's going on in their mind and what is, in their own sense, their own self-interest. And that was David Koresh. Uh, we can never say he might not have changed sure. his mind later on. But if there's anything that we could have done that would have guaranteed that we would have had the outcome we liked, the answer is absolutely not. There is no guarantee in this business. And, it's, and we're all upset and terribly, sure. uh, 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 terribly devastated by the outcome. This is not the outcome that any of us in the FBI wanted by right. any stretch of the imagination. Right. But uh, to suggest that we'll always now have an opportunity to be 100% successful with the David Koresh's of the world is simply not going to happen. Mr. McCarthy. Uh, I would comment that there is a parallel, uh, certainly uh, both cults, both suicidal, and we know that from what occurred. I would also add that a brave congressman flew there to confront Jim Jones in Guyana and was murdered on the airstrip. Right. And uh, one might uh, offer then that had he not confronted Jim Jones in an effort to resolve that incident in Jonestown, that 900 people wouldn't be dead. And... Uh, I think that would be just as unfair as saying that the FBI is responsible for the death of the children. That's I, bizarre. I, I fully agree with you. Gentlemen, could you come in? Congresswoman, Churchill said there's no risk-free battles, and in law enforcement there's no risk-free decisions. Prior to the ATF raid, I strongly recommended that we negotiate this situation. I believe that today. I believed it prior. And so from the ATF standpoint, 
and if we were ever to confront a situation like this again we would negotiate from the very beginning and i believe that that was an error and so the director feels along with me very strongly that we have to strengthen our negotiation capabilities to be able to deal with these violent groups it was a terrible tragedy and i do agree that when congressman ryan was killed and and those three i think three aides uh... it was very similar and in our planning uh... prior to the atf raid it was discussed frequently we use the word jonestown jonestown that's what's going to happen and one of the things we faced if we surround the place and they all commit suicide and all the critics will be out saying well, why'd you surround the place then you think of jonestown Absolutely. so that's Mr. Thank you. in these types of situations there are several dynamics one of course you have to have a charismatic leader but number two you have to have people who are willing to follow this individual and normally these types of individuals are looking for someone in life that they can turn over all of their responsibilities to and so in this particular event you have people not only giving up their homes giving up their possessions giving up their material wealth but giving up their freedom for the belief in this one individual it went so far as to giving up a sexual relations with their spouses and the ultimate act of power and control is turning over your own children to an individual like like the, uh, David Koresh. So you see a parallel between... I see a parallel too. Uh, it really comes down from a behavioral perspective of being power and control. Every charismatic leader that I've encountered, that is the main issue. Mr. Said, I, I would basically adopt the comments of the rest of the panel and just state that uh, I was not in Jonestown. I was in at Mount Carmel. I will never forget it. This individual was an absolute master of deception and to embrace some of the, the concepts set forth yesterday would, will be to enable Koresh to, to continue this pattern of deception uh, on these subcommittees. I want to thank all of you for, for your advice. Mr. Thank Mr. Lantos, you very much. your time is up. The committee will be in recess until after the vote that's now pending. Thank you. The Joint House Subcommittee hearing on the Waco investigation will continue in just a moment. First, some program information. C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Every morning, we take a look ahead at what's developing in our nation's capital and review the day's headlines. 